Ben Rosso here with Solid Applications. I am a uh, application engineer for SolidWorks for the last oh, 15, 15 years, I would say. So I wanted to welcome you to our series. Uh, that's my picture, recent picture of me. I didn't show a picture of me when I'm 30 years old. I want to uh, welcome you to our series on uh, our condensed lessons for simulation. Our normal uh, simulation linear static course is a three-day course, so we're condensing this course for users who might be a little bit intimidated or just not feel confident or comfortable using simulation. And we're condensing these lessons down to about five 45-minute uh, to one-hour uh, webinars. So we're condensing three days into less than half a day. Uh, so uh, we're going to touch on the basics. We're not going to get a chance to do a lot of repetition. You get the idea. So these are the this is what the calendar looks like for these presentations. May 14th, we did one on the basic simulation workflow according to Ben and uh, meshing and contacts. Uh, restraints and fixtures, we cover that on June 2nd. Again, those are available as webinars. Uh, applied forces and loads, that's today. Uh, the next one will be uh, materials and practical tips and then understanding your results where we're going to be slicing and dicing the various plots and output you can get post-processing. So today it's going to be the applied loads, applied forces presentation, or the lesson I should say. Now uh, I'm going to be doing my best to talk as slowly as I can. I know I've got a very fast rhythm, so with my strange American accent I want to try to keep uh, my syllables understandable here. I'm doing my best. Now <clears throat> here is a picture of the uh, our web page and you can see that uh, a couple of these icons down here are watch now icons for the previous videos so they are available uh, you'll have to register for them but uh, that will enable you to see the things you might have missed and this one register now for today will become one of these watch now icons in the future all right so that said <clears throat> today's lesson is going to be on forces and loads and the objective is going to be to learn about the available tools we have in solidworks or who I'm seeing people are leaving one moment here. Uh, is everybody able to uh, hear me? Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to look at the chat for a moment here. I'm hoping you can all hear me. Uh, I'm not seeing any response from anybody, so we will uh, I'll have to just go on faith. Okay, that said. So our objective here, our objective is to learn about the available tools in SOLIDWORKS simulation to apply loads to your model. Uh, and what I want you to be able to walk away with is know enough to apply loads that will adequately and accurately validate your design. Everything in an FEA study is a compromise. Some things are less of a compromise than others. So adequately and accurately means we want it to be enough, adequate enough to give you the information you need from your study and accurately enough what I mean by that is really make sure that you're not doing anything that's going to cause an inaccuracy because <clears throat> if everything is set up properly your results are going to be very accurate. So here's the agenda for today what the topics are a very very short uh, review catch up for those of you who have missed our earlier webinars we're going to talk about forces in terms of load direction the per items option uh, which is a regular gotcha uh, using split lines, that's a SOLIDWORKS function that we use all the time in SOLIDWORKS simulation. Torque and its limitations and the option instead of torque of applying a moment. Uh, remote loads, which is how we apply moments. Uh, pressure, and there's going to be a trick. Uh, and I also want to show you some non-uniform pressure functionality. Uh, gravity and centrifugal loads, those are force fields. No, this is not science fiction. Uh, bearing loads, I want you to think of a pad eye or a lifting lug where that would be useful. Then we'll talk about thermal loads. You can, you can apply a temperature to a body or a face, and we'll talk about importing thermal loads from flow simulation, either as forces or as uh, temperature loads, and uh, for a, a sim professional thermal study, uh, temperature distribution. Both of these would be imported temperature distributions as opposed to constant temperature loads. And then lastly, we'll talk about a remote displacement. Uh, acting on uh, an object from a distance. So first of all, we're going to go and talk about 
the, the little review, and then we're going to cover forces. All right. So uh, to start with, uh, I'll review and catch up. Those of you who have seen my previous presentations know that I like to work off the study tree. Certainly, you can work off the ribbon up above. You can work off the simulation menu if you like. I find everything is very close at hand by right-clicking on each of these different nodes or folders in the study tree. So when you create a new study, you're going to have these nodes that you can right-click on. So you simply right-click on uh, external loads. Everything in this presentation today is going to be accessed from external loads. So um, you're going to see that you have menu choices for your basic primary loads, force, torque, pressure, gravity, centrifugal, bearing load, temperature, and prescribed displacement, <clears throat> importing loads from flow or from a thermal study, uh, and the special loads, I like to call them remote load mass. With, this is really quite a Swiss Army knife of a tool. And then uh, also the copy icon. Don't forget, you can copy a load if you want to reproduce it uh, similarly. Just copy an existing load and then make a couple changes to it. So let's start with split lines and the load direction on forces and the per item uh, option. So when you make a split line, basically, this is a SOLIDWORKS function. And we use it uh, in uh, simulation for the purpose of creating some kind of a fictitious, fictitious loading face. In other words, uh, we have a large face like this, and we want to apply the loads here to specific areas on the face. So you'll sketch the areas, and then you'll select the face, and it'll create a split line. What that does is it breaks out separate faces uh, that you can use to apply the loads. Uh, one thing you want to be aware of is because the load will end at the border of the face very abruptly. You might have some stress concentrations with elevated stress there. So be aware of that. You might have to discount some high stresses that occur right at the, the boundary edge. This is also useful for fixturing, by the way. So if you have a large face and you want to split out little surfaces to hold the face rather than holding the entire face, it works well for fixtures. All right. Now let's talk about the direction of a load. If you apply a load to a flat face, most of the time you're going to want that load to be applied perpendicular to the face or normal to it. So that's pretty much the standard default. Uh, when you apply a load, you choose force, uh, it's going to come in with the default of normal to. And in most cases, I would say well over 50% of the cases, that's going to be the appropriate uh, option to, to go with. Um, what that means is that the force, even as the model deforms, the force will continue pushing in the same direction that's normal to the face before the study starts, before deformation starts. So this force in a linear static study is not going to change direction as the model deforms. When your diving board bends, the force is not going to tilt. Okay. Uh, selected direction allows you to be more specific. So you can choose your faces, but now you're going to choose a reference. So here you can see that selected direction was chosen and a reference face. Again, we have the pink color coding. That's this pink face over here. That face was chosen. You can use faces, you can use edges, you can use axes, pretty much anything uh, that you can, uh, you can select on. So now we have available to us three directions based upon the face, the flat face that we chose. Along plane one, along plane two, that means along the plane, either this way or that way. And to be fair, I never know which direction uh, you know, X or Y it's going to be. So sometimes I pick one, oh, I don't want that, and then I'll turn it off and pick the other one. And then you have normal to it. So that's what this icon is here, normal to the face. That would be the arrows pointing down. So along plane two would be the arrows pointing to the right. You've got a value of 2,500 and 6,000 pointing straight down. Now, next thing you want to know about is per item or total. This is an absolute gotcha. I get this help desk call about, oh, four to six times a year. <clears throat> Somebody calls up and says, hey, how come my study is, you know, four, five, ten times the stress that I'm expecting. This is an existing component. It's never broken. And simulation is predicting that it's like broken long before we ever got to the applied load. Uh, well, the gotcha is that you probably used per item rather than total. When you're selecting several faces to apply the load to, per item means that these values are going to be applied to each face. So the total load uh, that, that the restraints are going to see is all the all these loads multiplied by the number of faces, and it will be proportional to the area of the various faces. In this case, 
all, all six of these, there's one that's hidden here, by the way, uh, will be proportional to the area. These are all the same, excuse me, but if you have different sized areas that you have split out and applied the load to, it will be, the load will be proportional to the area if you choose total. If you choose per item, it's just gonna simply be the amount entered in these boxes, applied here, and applied here, and applied here on down the line. So this is a big gotcha because it means that you're applying many more loads if you have multiple loading entities. Be aware of that. I will touch on that again because it's such a common error. So let's jump over to the example here. I'm gonna jump on my uh, SolidWorks. And this is an example of split lines. You can see I'm in a sketch. This is the split line that I created. I just made a bunch of circles here. And from there, I went and created a split line. Split line can be found under uh, insert curve if you want to find it the slow way. Uh, I will actually put it on, it's in the curves menu. So I'll actually put it up here. And I also like to put it in my mouse gestures. So I would draw my uh, sketches and then right from the sketch, go to split line right there. And I use it often enough that uh, I, I make shortcut keys for it, okay? So that makes the split lines. And then when I go and look at the load points themselves, here's my study. You can see that this force was applied to these faces. So let me edit the definition of the force and I'll give you a little feel for this. So right now, this is applying a load of 6,000 kilogram force normal to the face in a downward direction six times, okay? If I want it to be a total of 6,000, I will choose uh, total instead of selected direction, I mean, instead of per item. Now, the other thing I can do is if I use selected direction, then I can choose a reference. Um, it, last time, what you saw in the PowerPoint, I picked this face. Here's another example. I could maybe pick <clears throat> this face here, and I could choose a direction that's going to go, well, that's not the one I want. Uh, that's going to go down, and that's going to go normal to it. So down would be, you know, the 6,000, and then the other value, maybe 2,500, would go to the right. And so you can see that it doesn't depend completely upon, completely upon which face you select. You still have three different directions that you can apply the load in. So that's how that will work as far as applying the load goes. So we talked about per item versus total we've talked about selected direction and we talked about using split lines which i like to do all the time so that said now we've covered our review and we've done our basic uh you know simple force application so now let's talk about torque so when you apply a torque what you're doing is you're selecting the entities that you want to apply it to in this case we're applying it to these two end faces of this split tube. Uh, then you'll choose a reference, an axial reference, because torque is based upon an axis, right? So an axial reference can be a literal axis. It can be a cylindrical face, which has an implied axis. So I chose a cylindrical face because, well, it was easy to pick. So you'll choose your axis <clears throat> or your cylinder, and then you'll enter a torque value, um, and you can reverse the direction if you'd like. Again, notice per item or total here. I've got it set to total. I want to define a total torque and I'm applying it and splitting it up between the two faces. So again, I'm reinforcing that gotcha on per item or total. Um, so what are the limitations of torque? Well, the limitations of torque are, for one thing, it works really well on solid shafts. Solid shafts don't split apart. They don't belly out when you apply a torque to them. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, the deformation is fairly small. <clears throat> but torque doesn't work so well when you have an open-ended tubular structure or even just a tubular structure that can expand, not in a linear or static study. And the reason why is the torque does not update its direction about the circle. It actually behaves more like what we call a couple, which basically uh, lo picks a location at a radi radial distance and just pulls in the opposite directions, but it doesn't update as the model deforms. So that's a problem. Uh, in nonlinear studies, it will do that better, but we're not into nonlinear studies here. We're doing lessons for linear static studies. So if you use moment and it is applied from the remote load dialog, that will actually update properly. Now this is going to require a coordinate system. This is a SOLIDWORKS function. 
generally involving a sketch and then adding it from reference geometry. Yes, it's a pain in the behind, <clears throat> but that's what you do to define a remote load, in which case we're going to define that as a moment. So there's your coordinate system def definition location. The reference geometry uh, drop down menu is going to be found under features, and then coordinate system, or you can just go to insert reference geometry coordinate system. Uh, <clears throat> then what you would do is you would choose instead of translational components, you'd leave that blank, you'd choose rotational comp components, uh, you'd give it a direction. That direction is going to be based upon the X, Y, and Z orientation of the coordinate system you defined. So you need to pay attention that these are aligned with your coordinate system. In this case, Z is running axial to my tube. So then you choose the option for a moment. Uh, now that's going to apply a moment to it. You can reverse it if you want, and you'll give it a value. That's how it works. And it really rocks. It works better because uh, it does update around the curvature. So the direction is a circular direction. Now, note this picture deformation is scaled up a lot by, I think, a factor of something like 2,000, just to give you a, a, a visual representation of the deformation. Uh, your actual mileage may vary, of course. So let's go to the example, and we'll jump onto our SOLIDWORKS here, and I'm going to uh, pick on my uh, uh, split tube. So first of all, I just want to give you a little example. That is a torque that is applied as a, just a plain old torque applied to the ends. So you'll see here, there are the faces. There is the uh, cylindrical face to give it a definition. Uh, we have total, not per item, and we have the value applied. And if you look at the uh, resulting plot, it looks like this. So here's what I'm going to do with this one. I'm going to animate it. And it's going to generate some frames. Let's stop this for a moment. We'll set that to a, a reasonable number of, of frames. It'll actually give us some detail. We're going to run it like that. So you can see that these faces are only moving left and right. All right, they're not following the curvature. And that's the limitation of torque. You can imagine again, like I said before, on a solid shaft, that's going to be OK, because the shaft isn't going to want to bend out like this. Now, if we go here, and we look at a remote load, let's look at the definition of the remote load. Well, as a matter of fact, I need to back up first and show you that we have a, a coordinate system that was placed in here. That coordinate system was based upon the center point and some directions. So I can edit it, and you can see what we're doing here. We have actually a sketch line and a center point. So it was made using the sketch that created this cut. So I put a couple lines in here. I use those to define the X and Y axes. This is a SOLIDWORKS functionality. You can put a coordinate system in SOLIDWORKS. It's got nothing to do with uh, simulation. We just use it in simulation. OK, that said, now let's go and edit our remote load. And we've got the two faces that we applied it to. That's where we start. The coordinate system was chosen. That defines our x, y, and z axes. Uh, I have a tendency to prefer putting my coordinate system where I want the load to be applied, but you'll see in another example uh, where uh, I, apply, I locate it somewhere else. So this is the location where it's acting from. These faces up here are the faces it's acting upon. Think of an engine, center of mass, located location here, engine mount faces located here. Okay, now then I've gone in here, I've selected my Z direction, I've chosen moment, I've given it a value, I've done a rigid attachment, because I wanted it to be a very simple calculation, so it attaches as if it's rigid. And that's what it looks like. Now let's go and look at the stress plot, and I'm going to look at this from the top view. And if I animate this one more time, you will see that it's actually following the curvature. Look at, look at this end in particular. You can see it's following the curvature as it goes around. So it's a more accurate representation of what we want to apply. All right, so this, when we talk about the accuracy, this gives you more accuracy in the actual application of that load. So now we've covered at this point torque and the limitations of torque and a better or more accurate way to apply it in circumstances where it's necessary moment.
So now we're going to talk about remote loads, and remote load is very uses the same dialogue that uh, the remote moment that, that we just chose. So this is going to be a short lesson uh, that goes over how to set up a remote load or a remote moment. Okay, so if the global coordinates, the standard origin in your part or your assembly, if that won't cut it for whatever reason, like you don't know exactly uh, where the point of application of the load should be uh, in coordinates, but you can define it easily with your own coordinate system, then I would say create a coordinate system. If not, you can give it X, Y, Z values and use the global coordinate system. So you're going to use a sketch. In this case, I put a sketch in here. You define the coordinate system again by picking the uh, the uh, point in the center and the x y axis, the z axis will follow. So once the coordinate system has been created, then you right click on external loads. I'm not even going to show you because we all know that's how we get to any of the loads we want. Uh, right click external loads, and you're going to choose remote mass. Well, I guess I am going to show you. So you choose remote mass, and uh, from there, how do we set up the remote mass or moment? So first thing you're going to do in the dialog is you're going to select what faces really receive the load. All right. Then you're going to choose your coordinate system. Uh, you can't choose it until you, you pick user defined as opposed to global. Then you're going to enter the coordinates for the load location. Uh, it may be all zeros if you've placed the coordinate system exactly where you want the loads to be, or it may uh, require some coordinates to be entered. In this case, I think I entered a value for the Z of 89, and that located the app point of application of the load right there. So then you're going to choose the type of loading. And this here is a picture I've set up where I just activated several different things. I've activated different axes. I've talked about, I'm going to be talking about translational components and rotational components. Each one involves a force option or a translation, uh, a motion option, essentially. So when you choose a force, you're choosing what something from the first column. Uh, in the Y direction, you're going to see that I've chosen a translation. And if I give it a non-zero value, that means I am forcing the face selected to move to a certain location, a certain distance. Okay. Here, we'll be entering a value in units of force. Here, we'll be entering a value in units of millimeters. Now, for rotational components, moment, this would be entered in uh, units of Newton meters or kilogram four centimeters or something like that. And if you cho choose a rotation, again, this will be in degrees. So you give it a non-zero number, you're telling it you're going to rotate X number of degrees. If you leave it at zero, it's going to prevent it from rotating at all. Same thing here. If this translation is set to zero, it is essentially like a fixture. It says you cannot move in the Y direction at all because I'm setting you to zero. So activating this and choosing translation is an active option that you're choosing. And then, of course, you enter values for each one. So let's go to the example. And we're going to jump down here to this component here. All right, so here we have a small assembly. A uh, quick example, there's our sketch, as you can see. And the coordinate system was built around that sketch. I think you've seen that once before, so that's not anything new for you at this point. Uh, let's look at the remote load. You can see two arrows pointing in at it, uh, one going to the right, one going in towards the model. So let's edit that remote load, and we'll see what it does. So we have all these faces selected, and these faces are all faces that are inside the area where the shaft would contact. Then we have chosen that same coordinate system that lives in the Flyout Feature Manager. Don't forget about that Flyout Feature Manager tree here. There's the coordinate system one. There it is selected in there. Uh, I've given it a, a Z component value, which is what places it out here. And I've chosen in the X direction, we have a force of 450 kilogram force. and in the Z direction, a value of 275, and the reverse button has been pressed, so that's why it pushes inward. And just to look very quickly at the result, again, deformation scale by default of about 1,250, and you can see what this type of force and motion is doing to the model, all right? That's the short story on how to create a remote load or a remote moment in that case. And again, one more time, right click the external 
loads and you'll see it down here under remote load mass. So this brings us uh, to remote load. We've done that. And next thing we're going to talk about pressure. Uh, I'm going to show you a trick and then I'm going to talk about non-uniform pressure. Now, if we look at this picture of a turbine vein, turbine vein, you'll notice if you look closely at the arrows, and this is one thing, you know, the idea of looking closely at what's going on in your study really is an important thing, though it's an easy tool to use compared to other uh, FEA tools. You really want to spend time scratching your chin sometimes and just staring at things. So one of the things that pops out at me right away is that the sizes of the arrows are different. Also, you'll notice that the arrows point normal to the surface, perpendicular to the surface everywhere by definition. That's what pressure does. You know, if you have a swimming pool and you gouge out a hole in that swimming pool, the pressure is going to all be normal to that hole at every point. And that's the case here, but we also have a non-uniform distribution. So the way it basically works is you right-click your external loads folder, you choose pressure, you choose the face that's going to receive the pressure, and then you're going to enter a uh, value for what the pressure is going to be in the proper units. It's really kind of simple. Now I've gone one step farther here. Um, I want to show you uh, that you can actually enter an equation for a non-uniform pressure. So here you can see I chose the option for non-uniform distribution. Again, you need a coordinate system to give you a, a reference. Uh, you can use char choose different types of coordinates uh, to use with your coordinate system. I chose Cartesian and I entered an equation. You can see the edit equation button will get you into the interface where you can actually enter an equation. And I basically just, it's an equation of, of uh, that, the, that the pressure is gonna be proportional to X uh, plus 6 and y plus 9. So it's a very simple equation that I've entered here, but we have functions like sine waves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can get more complex if you'd like. Let's look at another example. This is a trick that I uh, figured out one time. Somebody asked me, uh, it was a company that made uh, tanker trucks, and they make these long elliptical tanks that you see on the highway. They might carry water or fuel or, or gas or something like that. And they, uh, they, they said, well, look, uh, you know, we need to be able to analyze not only what the, the load of the fluid is, but um, what happens if we're going around a corner and the, the actual force is going a little bit sideways due to centrifugal force. So the question is, how do you model a, a tanker partially filled with water going around a corner? Well, what I did was first I created a split line at an angle with a sketch line like that and I applied it to the inside face, and I've colored that inside face green so you can see it different from the uh, top face. Then I inserted a coordinate system, and I used one of the sketch lines here to angle it slightly so it's perpendicular to the, to the water level. So I have a coordinate system where the y direction is pointing down, downward and at a slight angle. And my equation for a non-uniform pressure is y times uh, 27.7 psi per inch. Now, actually, to be fair, I should have done the uh, tangent relationship, and that should be slightly larger because we also have the centrifugal component to add to that. So that, to, to be fair, that's slightly off. It should be a little greater than that. Now, uh, you look at what the dialog looks like to set this up, same thing. Non-uniform distribution, choose your coordinate system, Cartesian coordinates, put in your simple equation, and it's, it's that easy to do. And you know what? It works like a charm. Here you can see that we have extra higher stress regions on the right side. The left side is, is pretty much blue, lower valued stresses, and we have higher valued stresses here showing that we have a difference in pressure left to right. So let's just take a quick look at this example here. And in SOLIDWORKS, I'm gonna go pick up my tank body model. So just to give you a little feel really quickly, uh, first thing I did was uh, I created a split line. So let's look at what the sketch looks like. Go normal to that sketch. There's my sketch right there. And I use that to build a split line. And that split line is applied to the interface of the model. All right, so it splits up the whole face. And then I simply colored the bottom face so you could see the difference. The coordinate system I, I put in there uses sketch lines for the x direction 
and for the y direction and of course i flip them as i needed them so the y direction which is all i'm interested in is pointing down this again is a solidworks functionality it is not a simulation functionality but simulation can use it so when you simply apply a pressure we applied the pressure to that face and we used non-uniform distribution a coordinate system and this is what the dialogue looks like where you enter your formulas. So this is something that's worth playing around with and seeing what kind of results you get. If I look at, let me go and hide that sketch because it's getting a little annoying. And we probably don't even need to see the coordinate system. So we'll hide the coordinate system and I'll show the stress plot. And if I look at this from a front view and then tilt it down, upward a little bit, you can see the variation between the left and the right sides. Note that I did put a fixture running down the middle here, which is what that second split line was. That's to a, a model up a beam holding it up in the middle. But you can see that the two sides are different. We have higher stresses over here due to the uh, sloped uh, liquid level. All right, so that's a fun one. And when I say fun, I mean it. I, I actually have fun with this stuff. And I hope you will too. Don't tell anybody that it's this much fun. So that is pressure and my little trick about uh, pressure at an angle. Now we're going to move on to gravity and centrifugal loads. This is our science fiction portion of the presentation because we're dealing with force fields. Right. So a gr gravitational field, a centrifugal field, those are literally by physical definition force fields. Gravity is so easy to set up. I'm not even going to show you pictures of it. All you have to do is, in most cases, if your y direction is where you want to go, that's how gravity will default. It'll come in at 9.81 uh, meters per second squared. You can always change it by choosing a different plane, an, an edge, to give it a direction. Just make sure that when you're done, the arrow points the way you want it to point, and the value is correct. It's very simple. Centrifugal loads, you know, not much more complicated. So what you're going to need to reference is a... Uh, a line or an axis, a rotational speed, and uh, and or a rotational acceleration. Actually, the line that I've chosen, let me back up one step. The line that I've chosen is, is a line that's well below this one in the model. You'll see that when I go to the model. So here I have chosen a rotational speed of 6,000 RPM. And this one, as you can see, is an acceleration, all right, of RPM squared, okay? So... Now we'll go to the example and take a look at that. All right, so the model I want to use in this case is the turbine blade. So first of all, I want to show you about the pressure. Uh, we've seen what it looks like. Here's what the pressure looks like when it's just a pressure and the result on uh, just the pressure. And it's interesting, and we've actually exceeded yield here. I'm going to talk about this whole aspect of exceeding yield in a linear study in the next uh, lesson that, that we, we do on uh, on the 30th so uh, just you know you can you can take that with a grain of salt for the moment uh, this is a very strong material i believe it's made out of titanium so it's a high yield stress anyway so we've got a maximum stress of about 1200 uh, megapascals here uh, and it's interesting that when we apply the centrifugal load now you see both the pressure and the centrifugal load Let's look at the definition for just a moment. You can see that the line chosen is this, uh, this line here that was used to create the axis. Uh, and there's our RPM and no acceleration. So what's interesting to me about this one is that if I look at the uh, you know, stress plot, the actual stress, maximum stress in the same spot is a little lower because it's being uh, the, the the tensile effect of the pressure is being counteracted by the tensile effect in a radial direction. So interestingly enough, the max, the worst case stress is a little bit lower with that, that centrifugal force. Who knew? So when I scratch my chin thinking about those kinds of things, what happens is that I learn something. So that's, that's an interesting phenomenon to uh, discover. May not be true in every case, but it's, it's true in this case. All right, so we've talked about centrifugal loads and pressures. Uh, that's done. Let's talk about bearing loads. So when you think about bearing loads, you're thinking about either a lifting lug or some sort of a pad eye. Um, so have you ever done this? You can see here that we've got a force 
applied to the inside face of that hole. So something's being lifted by this hole uh, or something, the hole's being pushed on. You just apply a force, may, maybe going to the right, and you just apply it to the center of the hole. Now, that's kind of okay. It's not real realistic because you're applying the force to the entire face. This is a stress plot of just the face of the hole. Maximum value is 46. Put that in your pocket for a moment. We'll come back to it. So the force is a force to the right, and the maximum stress is down here, but it's being applied on all sides of this surface. So if I'm not really interested in the pad eye in itself, uh, I'm really interested in the effect of the loading or the restraint on the rest of the model, then that's a reasonable, uh, a reasonable assumption. So I would put that in the adequate category but it's not in the accurate category. Adequate, but not accurate. So if you're interested in that surface of the pad eye, if you really are part, if you're either studying the pad eye or part of your study involves what happens to the pad eye, um, the bearing load with the direction and a choice of the sinusoidal or parabolic distribution is much more realistic. You know, these are engineering accepted uh, approximations of the distribution of a load applied uh, radially by a shaft on a hole. So in this case, what you've got is a scenario where we're really just applying the load in a sinusoidal or parabolic distribution to the right side, and we're not going to be applying the load to the left side. And the difference is that the maximum stress, because it's more concentrated in certain areas, and we're not pushing this side as well as pulling this side, the maximum stress is higher as we would expect and it's more realistic so this is a, a more accurate option if it matters to you it takes a little more to set up so we're going to go and look at an example of how you set up a bearing load let's go to my model of a little pad eye uh where's my little, uh, cargo cargo tied out okay so first of all if we look in the tree uh somebody had previously put a split line in here and uh, they had also put in a coordinate system based upon a sketch. So our coordinate system has X going to the right. That will be the direction of our force. So let's look at this study here where we have applied, oh, excuse me, a, uh, a plane force. So when we have a plane force, we've uh, simply chosen a force, right? I'll edit the force. Uh, it's applied to the face, it's applied all over the face. The reference direction is the right plane. The value is 900 pounds, uh, my American units, uh, to the right. Normal to the plane, you can see the arrows pointing to the right, very simple. But just as the force is pushing on this side of the hole, it's pulling on that side of the hole. Again, not the most realistic thing. If I show the stress plot here, you'll see that just that, that face, uh, our maximum stress here is about 46 megapascals. If I then instead go here where I've applied a bearing load instead, let's look at the definition of the bearing load. Choose the same face. We do use a coordinate system. That will give us two coordinate directions. We don't get an axial coordinate system. That's not what a bearing load does. So if your force is going at an angle, you'll have to extract the two components, the X and the Y component to use. Um, so you'll have to do a little bit of math to figure them out. Our force is going strictly to the right, so we just apply it in the X direction, and that's it. And you could choose sinusoidal or parabolic distribution. So that means that the load is actually diminishing as we get up to the halfway point. There's really no load on the back side of this at all. So now let's look at what that stress plot looks like, as I showed before. You can see the higher stress value uh, where it's being pulled on. This is not being pushed in the same direction to help it and to reduce the stress. So this is a more accurate result and it's a more accurate boundary condition applied to our study. So that covers bearing loads. Now let's talk about applying thermal loads and the various ways that we can do that. So first of all, one of the loads you can apply if you simply right click the external loads folder is a thermal load. And a thermal load is going to allow you to choose a body or a surface or multiple surfaces to apply a uniform temperature to. Now, 
this you should know is just going to be a uniform temperature. It's going to be the same everywhere. So what that means is that it's going to cause expansion or contraction. One other thing you should know here is that you can use a select all exposed faces if you want. Okay, normally I would use the flyout feature manager and pick the body. If it's an assembly, I might pick the part to get, kind of get the idea. Uh, so I choose the body. I will uh, base this upon a reference temperature and study property. So although I've applied 385 degrees Celsius to this body, what does that mean? It's got to actually have a reference temperature for expansion and contraction. What temperature is it changing from? So in your study properties, if you right click the top of the study and go to properties, you have a tab for flow and thermal effects. Back up one step and you can give it an input te temperature and you can also give it a the, the reference temperature, right? So the input temperature is the load we gave it and the reference temperature is what it's expanding from. It's got to have a temperature difference, right? And it will only apply to the parts that you apply that temperature load to. So expansion or contraction can be created that way. And it's all based upon the material property, the coefficient of thermal expansion. Okay, so you right click external loads, you go to thermal effects, and uh, that will this will enable you to import a load. So we're talking now about a temperature distribution from a thermal study or from a flow simulation study. In this case, the first thing I'm gonna look at is a simulation professional uh, heat transfer study. So if you have SimPro, then this is how you import these. If you don't have SimPro, then this is, uh, is not available to you. So let's say you do a thermal study and then you have a temperature distribution, varying temperature across your model you can right click uh, external loads and choose thermal effects. So by the same token, you can simply right click the study and go to properties and go to thermal effects, choose this option, uh, temperatures from a thermal study. And from your model, there will be whatever thermal studies you have available in this dropdown. You pick one of those and you've applied a temperature distribution, varying temperature across the model. Similarly, you can import uh, results of a flow sim study and that will be another option further down the uh, the uh, study properties uh, imported temperature from si SOLIDWORKS flow simulation and then you browse for the study here let's go to the example so I'm going to go back to the uh, little blade and here you can see that we have a thermal study and that thermal study gives a thermal temperature profile, varying temperatures, right? Okay, so if I go into, let's say, this uh, centrifugally loaded one, you can see that a thermal, uh, a thermal temperature was added, right? Let's edit that guy. And that brings us right to the study properties, flow thermal effects, temperature from thermal study. We chose the only thermal study we have, and that will bring in that temperature profile. So let's say, you know, if we had this, if this thing was touching something solid over here, then it would expand and it would be under compression. You get the idea. Okay, that's basically how it works. So that's covered our uh, application of a simple thermal load or importing loads from a uh, thermal study or from flow simulation. And lastly, we're going to talk about remote displacement. One of the most underused functions in SOLIDWORKS simulation. So the thing about a remote displacement is that most people tend to think of various ways of pushing on something or pulling on something. That's why we apply forces, remote loads, remote masses, pressures, and all that kind of stuff. But you can also tell something to just move. Instead of giving it a force or a load or something like that, we can actually literally displace something. And what you can get from that is, well, what are the resulting forces? That is going to be talked about two lessons from now in the final lesson on post-processing. So remote displacement, it's actually found from the remote load mass dialog. I think I mentioned this is kind of a Swiss army knife. It's a do everything tool. So we're going to look at how we do this. So you right click your uh, external loads and you choose remote mass. 
right? And by choosing that translation option instead of a, uh, a force option, you are giving it a remote displacement. And you notice that I have put in 0 0.5 millimeters, a half millimeter. Uh, so we're changing this from, from a remote load to a remote displacement. And it will actually show like that in the loads or the fixtures folder. Sometimes it shows up in the fixtures folder after you've done it. So think of a pry bar, let's say, inserted into that pad eye of ours, okay? Something like that. So you displace it upward from a distance. Uh, and the result, of course, is that you're going to be able to bend something upward as if you had that pry bar in there. So to the example, let's take a look. So we're going to go back to the little pad eye study we have. And I've got a study called remote displacement. So I've got, you know, my various restraints that are keeping things uh, in position. And then uh, let's look at this. Again, how do we find it? Right-click external loads, go to remote mass. All right, let's edit this guy, double click. And we're applying it to this face, great. We're using a coordinate system. The Z direction points out this way, that's where we want it. So X and Y are zero. Uh, our units are in inches, so if I change that to, uh, let's say centimeters, that's gonna be about 15 centimeters. You know, the fact that we can swap units in here, I often use this as my own little private, uh, unit converter on the fly. <laughs> I, I like to do that, to change units just to double check because I live in the inch world and the millimeter centimeter world. Okay, translational components selected, rotational components unselected. Uh, I'm talking about a displacement in the Y direction. Remember, Z is where I locate it. Y is the direction I'm gonna push it. Click on the translation button, enter a value, toggle it up or down to reverse it, arrow pointing upward here, as you can see. So that means we're going to be lifting it up a certain distance. And of course, the result, there's our stress plot uh, magnified by a factor of about 56. But that gives you the idea of what's going on with that. So that's how you apply a remote uh, displacement. It's done through the remote load dialog. So at this point, I have covered remote displacement. So let's look at all the different things we've touched on here. It's been quite a bit, hasn't it? So uh, I think I've covered, you know, about 80% of the basic stuff. I've left a couple of details out. That's what you get when, when we, uh, you know, we do this whole three-day course. We go into this in a lot more detail. But I think this will give you enough to, uh, to get you going, right? So uh, that's me done on this presentation. And uh, I wanted to just tell you, uh, that we've got a few more of these coming up. Now, these condensed lessons, like I said, today we've managed to cover the applied forces and loads. The ones coming up on the 30th is going to be working with materials and practical tips. You know, I've been working on preparing for this, and as I prepared for it, I was scratching my chin thinking, oh, what am I going to show about materials? And I know I've got some my, my little my toolbox street type tips that I'd like to show you. What am I going to talk about materials? And I started going down the list, making up the the topics and it started getting pretty big and there's actually a lot to talk about when it comes to materials and how to set up your various parts and bodies especially in assemblies with mixed mesh so there's actually this there's more uh, than more that, that meets the eye uh, to this one then lastly we're going to have the post processing course on July 7th uh, so that I'm looking forward to that one that's uh, the next one is working with materials and so we'll see that in about 12 days from today. Uh, again, you can look at any of the past ones just by clicking the Watch Now icon on the Solid Apps uh, webpage. It's right on the front page there. Uh, any of the future lessons that remain, you can uh, register for them. Uh, you just have to catch them as they scroll by. Okay. So I wanted to thank you for attending. Uh, we really do appreciate your business. And the last thing I leave, want to leave you with is, may the force be with you. And that's our presentation done, folks.